Good afternoon, everyone. Continuing the activities of the second Brazilian symposium on fractional calculus, I have the honor and the pleasure to bring you directly from University of Illinois, Chicago, Professor Richard Majan, a fundamental reference in bioengineering with his famous books, Fractional Calculus in Bioengineering, and several important articles. A divisor of several masters and doctors, and with more than 15,000 citations in academic Google, Professor Richard Megan is one of the legendary scientists of fractional calculus. Professor, thank you very much for kindly accepting our invitation. We would like to be in person with you here in Brazil, presenting you some of our natural and cultural wonders. But as we cannot, we are very happy with your virtual presence here with us. Thank you once and again. Nice to have you here, Professor. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, presenting and sharing some of my work and my colleagues' work, and also to uh, uh, answer any questions and, and interact with the, uh, the audience. And uh, uh, what's the next step now? Well, now we are going for your presentation, and I'll, I'll leave you. OK, so let me start my slides, I hope. OK, uh, Just can you see my first slide, Ruben? Yes, it works perfectly. OK, good, good. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, my talk today is going to be on uh, the applications of fractional calculus in uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, I uh, am, am uh, uh, looking forward to uh, sharing the work that we've been doing, and I, I'll try to uh, uh, do so in a, in a reasonable time frame, I hope. But uh, I'm, uh, like you say, I'm, it's too bad we can't do this in person, but uh, I'm happy to be able to, to do what we can. Uh, first of all, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jose de la Sosa and uh, Professor Rubens uh, Camargo for inviting me to present this talk and to the SBMAC for their support for this symposium. Uh, Rubens, if you or anyone else has a question, uh, you know, feel, you know, j just say it because I, I have no visual feedback here. And so I, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Okay. okay? Sorry. Good, good. Okay. Uh, a summary or synopsis of the talk. Uh, this is a cartoon I got from a British magazine. Gentlemen and gentlewomen, uh, this is just to give you an idea. Actually, there are lots of wires and things. Uh, so uh, uh, what I'll be talking about is largely an overview. And the basic idea is to show how fractional calculus models, particularly of diffusion and relaxation, can be used to capture the complexity of brain tissue as it's revealed in MRI. The outline of the talk is as follows. I'm going to divide it into three sections. The first section is context. I'll try to put the work we're doing with fractional calculus uh, uh, in MRI into its historical context. Uh, Next, I'll try to establish connections between MRI and fractional calculus. And then at the end, if we have time, I'll uh, speculate a little bit with conjectures about uh, what aspects Professor, of this could be continued. Let me yes. interrupt you just for one second. It sure. would be nice for us if you could click on this hide, this, is, this little button here, hide. Oh, I worry about hide. Uh, yeah, I saw that button there, and I really didn't want to do it, but I did it. Now what do thank I do? Thank you. Now wait. Okay. Okay. Now we're ready to go. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that there, and I, I, I was tempted to hit it, but then I was figured, well, it's annoying, but if I hit hide and everyone goes away, it's going to be very sad. <laughs> no, no, it was fine. Okay. Good. But thank you. Okay. So, uh, uh, let's get on with it. Uh, context. I'm going to use a Venn diagram. I'm going to look at the fields of fractional calculus, which is the subject of the symposium, magnetic resonance, which is the field in which I have been mostly applying fractional calculus, and then the sort of unifying or overlapping uh, area of random processes, which is something I don't really understand, but it certainly has overlap uh, with both fractional calculus, 
with things like the continuous time random walk model and with magnetic resonance. Uh, so magnetic resonance, as you may or may not know from learning something in chemistry about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, and in bioengineering about magnetic resonance imaging is used to, at one extreme, probe molecular structures, and at the other extreme, make pretty pictures of your knee, your liver, and your brain. Fractional calculus, you are all familiar with to some extent. It involves uh, different models of generalized non-integer order operators. Uh, most of what I do follows the work of Metzler and Klafter and Minority in, the in using the continuous time random walk model. A little bit of fractional motion but uh, I'll make that clear which one of those models we're using. Uh, random processes, it is the basis of thermodynamics. Heat, for Pete's sakes, is actually just random motion. Diffusion and relaxation in, in, in the cases of MRI involves molecular and translational motion of molecules. Principally in MRI, it's the motion of the water molecules that is uh, most, uh, uh, of, of most interest, partly because we're mostly water, and partly because the water is able to probe intra-extracellular environments in ways that uh, provide uh, changing signal intensity that can be used to generate contrast. But I'll tell you more about that later. Okay. Connections with fractional calculus. So I, I think it's good to understand the the overall context of where we're going, but the connections between what you know and what I hope to discuss and perhaps what you might want to learn today uh, is the purpose of this chart. So fractional calculus uh, has applications almost everywhere <clears throat> that there's a complexity in the material or the processes. Uh, it was <clears throat> pioneered with uh, 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 the, the work of, of uh, Oldham and Spanner in electrochemistry. Uh, it's been applied in viscoelasticity and in dielectrics. Uh, we'll be talking today about its application in magnetic resonance. The thing about fractional calculus, as you know, is there's nothing fractional about it. It's all calculus all the time. It just allows you to generalize the kernels of integral equations in such a way that you can uh, include non-local events in time or space. And so you're messing with the math, which gives you uh, insight and it also provides some complications. In MRI, we'll apply it uh, to the particular field of, 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 of imaging. Uh, magnetic resonance is, a, is also a large field uh, chemists do nuclear magnetic resonance, and a lot of physicists do what is called electron spin resonance. We'll talk about MRI, and within the MRI field, I'll be looking at relaxation and diffusion. Those of you who have done any applications with fractional calculus typically look at generalization of the models of uh, relaxation in a viscoelastic sense or diffusion in a, in a, in a molecular sense. In MRI, the relaxation follows classical models of Gaussian or normal diffusion, uh, leading to exponential decays with uh, characteristic time constants, T1, T2. In fractional calculus generalizations of relaxation, uh, so-called anomalous non-Gaussian diffusion, we all know that the exponential becomes generalized to the mittag leffler function, and you still get time constants, but you also get uh, the order of the uh, fractional operator in time that modulates these effects. And a it, it, simple way to look at this is that it introduces a distribution of relaxation times. Diffusion is a big part of clinical imaging, in particular, the imaging of orthotropic tissues, muscle, connective tissue, spinal cord, white matter in the brain. That is, you can use the uh, restricted diffusion to uh, map out the structure of tissues. And those models, again, they're Gaussian. You get a diffusion coefficient, which is directionally dependent. So it becomes a diffusion tensor. And you can make images of this uh, distribution 
in space as diffusion tensor imaging. With fractional calculus, we allow the diffusion to be non-Gaussian. We generalize the diffusion equation to involving uh, space and time fractional derivatives. In the non-Gaussian case, we get uh, to choose those derivatives in the fractional world. Uh, I'll use in my talk what I've done mostly in my application, which has involved the Caputo derivative for time and the Reese derivative for space. So you get the diffusion. You always get what you start with in relaxation or diffusion, but you get extra parameters that, uh, in, in the case, the alpha and the beta here, uh, I will relate or connect to fractional time and space derivatives. You still with me, Ruben? You still there? Yes, Hello? Professor. Okay, good. I just... Uh, okay. <laughs> just fine. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'll talk about relaxation. And, uh, and and I'll be looking in general at the intersection of all three of these fields, fractional calculus, magnetic resonance, and random processes. I'll look at relaxation first, and then I'll look at diffusion for the, for the rest of the talk. Uh, I guess it should be obvious, but I'll just list the names, that the work we're talking about here is, uh, is basically a who's who of mathematicians, physicists, and engineers. If you look within the field of MRI, uh, Block Purcell, uh, who discovered the NMR phenomena, and uh, then it was later extended into magnetic resonance imaging, uh, the, those pioneers uh, provided the foundation of this molecular probe. Fractional calculus, Riemann Louisville, Grunwald Letnikoff, Oldham Spanner, Mitte Leffler, Caputo, I can go on. You guys know all these. Uh, random processes, uh, it's hard to underestimate the significance of Einstein, Smolachowski, Fokker Planck, Langevin, Markov, Gauss, Poisson, Wiener, and Levy. Uh, all of these mathematicians contributed to extensions of physical concepts in such a way that one could get a better understanding of processes as they uh, are extended in time and space uh, throughout all of physics. And now, as in, I will show in some of my work, uh, as it applies in bioengineering and biomedical imaging. The Bloch equation is the fundamental ordinary differential equation that governs magnetic resonance phenomena. Uh, it's a simple, uh, well, it's nonlinear actually, but uh, in a linearized form, it's a simple processional motion of a, a magnetic field, M, uh, in the presence of an applied field, a B, in such a way that the orientation of the vector can be manipulated and localized. Uh, anything you do to the magnetic field means you're operating on this vector cross product here, involves all sorts of components that can either cancel or reinforce each other. But no matter what you do, uh, when you stop doing it, or even while you're doing it, there are inexorable relaxation processes occurring. And these T1s and T2s basically are just reflecting the first and second law of thermodynamics, that the, that the system, if you leave it alone, and even if you don't leave it alone, it will tend to equilibrium, and it will tend to uh, uh, the lowest energy configuration, and it will tend to uh, maximize entropy. Uh, the processional motion of magnetic fields uh, involve a concatenation of static, uh, time-varying, uh, linear, and uh, uh, linear variations in magnetic fields. Uh, the net result is that when you apply a radio frequency pulse to at a proper frequency uh, to a magnetic uh, the active nuclei, the M0 vector here, uh, which here is is, is, uh, um, is oriented along the y-axis, uh, can be tipped to any, any orientation perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. As soon as you've done that, uh, the, the magnetization just spirals back around and around and around until it converges back along the z-axis. And this this rate at which this happens is the so-called Larmor frequency. In a conventional MRI of, say, 1.5 Tesla, this is 64 megahertz. It's like channel two or three on, on US TV. It's, it's RF. 
Uh, and this uh, process of relaxation uh, decays in time uh, following T1 and T2, which relates to the either the Z or the XY component. I teach a whole course in this. There are books in it. Uh, we're going to, of course, do the usual trick. <laughs> we're going to mess with the math. We're not going to try to mess with the fields. We're going to try to change the order of this time derivative. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the time derivative by a, a fractional order time derivative. And uh, I, I, I'm assuming that uh, in other presentations and in other coursework, uh, or in other readings, you have encountered uh, different kinds of time derivatives. I'll focus principally on the Caputo uh, uh, time derivative. And uh, for this particular process, since there's a T1 and T2, I'm going to specify that the T1 and T2 uh, could have a different order. That is, the T2 decay might fi follow an alpha time derivative and the T1 a beta time derivative. All through fractional calculus, uh, time and space and uh, different forms of derivatives are are typically represented by an alpha or beta. You got to be really careful because here I'm talking about alpha and beta as relating to the T1 and T2 relaxation time. Uh, this is not always the case. You have to always be careful uh, to make sure that what you think the terms relate to are in fact what the author means. Uh, speaking of the author, uh, this work, it, it was written up, uh, I guess, a year or two ago uh, in a, a, a review article in the Critical Reviews of Biomedical Imaging. And for details, you can go and, and, and read there, or you can go back and listen to some of the talk or read some of my other papers. Uh, of course, what happens when we apply a fractional uh, model to a relaxation process is we convert the exponentials into Mittag-Leffer functions. Here, I've just assumed that we're going to leave the, the Z component alone. We'll just uh, use a fractional derivative uh, alpha here on the, on the XY components. And so what happens is you still get this helical motion after you perturb magnetization in that it returns to its orientation along the Z axis here. But the rate at which it returns that is, the decay rate follows the Mittag Leffler. And the Mittag Leffler, of course, falls faster than an exponential at low at early times and then falls like a power law, uh, t over t2 star to the alpha uh, for, for longer times. So, uh, what one finds is that in addition to the t2 characterization of the process in the exponential sense, you have a decay rate that also varies as the alpha. So as the alpha drops from 1 to 0 0.9 to 0 0.7, uh, 0.8 and 0 0.7, you get uh, a tighter or faster decay. Uh, this model has been applied to, to look particularly at complex tissues where uh, the usual exponential model doesn't work. So the, the, the next step is almost often a multi-exponential model, but exponentials more or less always go away eventually. The fractional order models with these power laws can persist for quite a long time. Okay, so uh, since relaxation in time is fairly well understood, I thought I would, for the rest of the talk, uh, talk about the use of fractional calculus in diffusion, where both space and time derivatives play a part. How are you doing on time, Ruben? You still there? Yes? No? Ruben? Am I still here? Yes, you're still here. Oh, wait, and I was still here. having time. Oh, okay. My, my okay. microphone was closed. Okay, no, I sorry, I was getting really worried. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Okay, well, I, I, so I've talked about relaxation. Now I'm going to talk a little more about diffusion. Okay. The diffusion issue is, is interesting because uh, there's basically a mismatch. When you, take, when you look at an MRI or a picture, or a, a virtual slice of the brain, of, of a real brain, in this case an excised fixed, fixed brain from an animal, uh, when you look at an MRI, you see these slices. The, the, the field of view is typically the full size of the head. The pixel resolution is on the order of millimeters. But when you look in a biology or a pathology book, when you look at the structure of tissues, you see cells. Cells are on the order of a micron. So when you look at microscopy and you ask questions about cellular 
tissue organization at the cell level, you're at microns. There's a factor of a thousand at least, maybe 10,000. So this is the place where fractional calculus comes to the front because we take the low resolution MRI, the high resolution structural model of tissue, we use fractional calculus to inform a geometric model of the structure. In this case, these are bundles of axons in the corpus callosum that connects the right and left halves of the hemisphere together here. You, you can use fractional calculus to account for things like permeability or distributions of diameters uh, within this connection. And then this fractional calculus model is fit to not just one image, but many, many images collected by varying the parameters, not only in direction, but in terms of diffusion time and diffusion sensitivity. The net result of the fitting process is that you still get the picture that you started with, except you get colored dots. And the colored dots are basically the values of the fractional parameters that you have fit to the model. So where you see red dots here or yellow dots here, you have higher or lower values of your fractional order, say alpha or beta in your model. And so the idea is that the fractional model allows you to describe complex structures that you use as a tool for describing the microstructural subvoxel organization of what you see in the image. And then the $64,000 question is, as disease or age or other development occurs, uh, it's the microstructure that changes. You can't see that necessarily in the conventional MRI, but you can see it if your model is sensitive to those parameters. Okay, so how does this work in MRI? Well, you start with a block equation. Everything begins there. And you add diffusion and you add flow. And so... I won't talk about it, but uh, magnetic resonance is great for, image, for imaging flow. And uh, diffusion is, is, is imaged by uh, appending to this time rate of change of magnetization, uh, the motion of the uh, imaged uh, uh, nuclei as it diffuses or as it flows. Uh, you do this by applying more radio frequency and gradient pulses. Uh, and, and the idea here briefly is that you apply a pulse and you uh, spin label particular uh, uh, parts of your brain or parts of your image. And then you uh, flip the whole thing over and wait a little bit. And then you apply the same pulse again. And if, if the sample hasn't moved, if there's no diffusion, if there's no flow, you get nothing. There's no change. But if there's been flow, if there's been change, then you get less of a signal than you would if there had been no motion. So you get a shift in phase or a shift in amplitude. Principally, the flow gives you a shift in phase. The phase that comes about with the, with the diffusion pulses is resolved as a change in amplitude. So if you just look at the XY component here of the magnetization, and there's a T2 relaxation term. And so now what we're getting here is we've got a Laplacian operator here. So we have a spatial variation in this magnetization. We have a T2 relaxation, we have a precessional motion, and we have time rates of change. Uh, if you fiddle with the parameters somewhat, you can actually solve this and get a simple exponential. And the exponential uh, decays as a function of parameters you can control. Everything in this line here corresponds to a width or an amplitude of a pulse in that picture. So this is, this is the, these are the, these are either the physical factors or the system parameters that you can adjust. And so when you adjust those parameters, you will see the signal decay and it will decay at a rate that, at a decay rate. And the decay rate uh, works out to be exactly the diffusion of the labeled molecule in the sample. So life is good. It's a simple exponential. Until you actually look at some different tissue. Here, here's some, some signal collected from uh, uh, the brain of a, of, a, of a human subject, actually. Uh, 
this is a cerebral spinal fluid, the, the water that bathes the, uh, the tissues in the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, the gray matter, what we're thinking with now, hopefully, uh, it shows up in the cerebrum and cerebellum. And then the white matter is basically the, 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 uh, the connecting cables, if you will, uh, between the uh, uh, functioning units within the brain. And you can see here, this is plotted on a semi-log graph. So, so B is the parameters that you select when you're imaging. And the slope of the decay here, since this is a semi-log plot, this is a log scale, shows up as a straight line if and only if it's an exponential. If it curves a little bit, it means that the diffusion coefficient may be changing as a function of B or time. If it curves a lot, it means that your model is not right. And what we see here is, of course, uh, water is water, and the CSF decays linearly, and, and, the, and the, the decay rate is very close to the uh, known diffusion coefficient of water at that temperature and under those conditions. Uh, the gray matter looks linear for the most part until you get to really high B values on a, on a, on a semi-log axis, and, but the gray matter doesn't. So this becomes an opportunity for uh, applying fractional calculus. It's, it's, uh, we could apply multi-exponential models. That's what everyone did first. Uh, we could apply a stretched exponential model, which we all know is just a crude approximation of a mittag leffler function, but uh, they give you some information, or we could just boldly go where no man has gone before, or woman in the Star Trek sense, and try to capture this with some sort of fractional model. And uh, that's what I did. I just, I said, okay, uh, the block tory equation, at least for the XY component here, has a time derivative, it has a processional component, and it has uh, a space derivative. And I said, why don't we just uh, generalize the time derivative to a fractional time and, and generalize the space to a fractional space? And let's not mess around with precession, that we need, we need the spins to be doing their thing uh, on their own. So we're just going to not bother with fractionalizing that. That's, that's a bridge too far. The net result is you can still do MR imaging. You can still make really nice pictures of the brain image-wise, the resolution here, submillimeter. This is a human brain uh, in a uh, uh, coronal section. And the, uh, the uh, uh, map here of the diffusion coefficient shows you uh, light or dark blue areas that are related to the values of the diffusion coefficient. So uh, the, uh, uh, the higher diffusion coefficients are here in the, in the light blue and the lower diffusion coefficients there in the blue. Uh, with the fractional model, as I showed you earlier, you fit the same data and the convergence gives you the alpha and beta values. In this case, the alpha and mu, alpha, beta, mu and tau values. And so you end up getting parameters that allow you to characterize the white matter, gray matter, CSF compartments in this slice of the brain uh, with different factors that may or may not reflect different aspects of the microstructure. And that's, as I said earlier, is, is where the important questions can be posed because it's the change in microstructure that happens with age, with Alzheimer's, with uh, Parkinson's, with any kind of uh, neurodegenerative disease that we would like an early view of. And you can't see it at pathology until you take a brain sample, which is not possible, and you can't see it in a conventional MRI. So uh, the, the first representation of this is, is it actually leads to a stretched exponential. And, and this was good. I did this dec decade ago uh, because the stretched exponential model had been fit. But here we showed that the, the, the fractional order wasn't just an ad hoc parameter. It could be viewed as the order of the space derivative. Uh, and if you think in general of how you could modify things, you could envision the uh, diffusion equation as being diffusion in time of order alpha and diffusion in space of order beta. And the solution of this, at least in the case space, if you take a Fourier transform of this in space, is just the Mittag-Leffler. And it turns out that uh, this model 
uh, is almost exactly what you do in MRI. The, the, the wonderful thing about MRI is you don't collect data as a function of time and frequency and then take a Fourier transform or a Laplace transform or do all kinds of funny modeling with it. You collect the data line by line and you collect that data in case space. It's just like X-ray crystallography. You're collecting spatial frequencies and you're looking at the decay of each spatial frequency. And it, when you make it diffusion weighting, uh, this becomes a Q parameter and this becomes a diffusion time. So that in collecting diffusion weighted data, you are collecting uh, the, the uh, parameters of your diffusion model as it's projected to be varied, varying with uh, fractional time and space. And of course, we understand the Gaussian model occurs when uh, beta, the space derivative is two, and alpha, the time derivative is one right here. And then uh, there's a linear relationship here back to the origin. And this corresponds to a mean squared displacement that looks like two alpha over beta. Anything that diffuses faster than that, we call super diffusion. Anything that goes slower than that, we call subdiffusion. Uh, anytime we get above and beyond out here in this range, it turns out that the processes will immediately collapse to Gaussian. So uh, up here in this, uh, top section, you have more or less normal diffusion. So uh, this model has been fit uh, extensively to this data I showed you earlier. I showed you earlier data from the brain corresponding to CSF, gray matter, and white matter. And this is a rat brain, actually. And these little circles here are showing you that the signals that are acquired here are collected in different parts of the brain. And then we fit the brain, uh, the, the, all the tissue, uh, to a generalized uh, Mittag-Leffer model. And then this representation allows us to not just to make graphs and fit curves, but to fit every pixel in the image. And this is what you know pays radiologists and doctors big bucks, because you get really good pictures of every pixel for every slice in the brain. And so here we get the diffusion map that We've, we get before, but you also get maps of the alpha and beta decay rates. And you have to, since you've messed with time and space, you got to be careful about the units. So there are time and space uh, parameters that, that or scale factors that have to be inserted. And if you want to combine time and space, you can mix everything together. And uh, one of my students, uh, uh, Carson Ingo uh, developed a whole normalized spectral entropy, which which sort of makes takes these fuzzy diagrams and makes a very pretty map. Again, if you're going to take it to the clinic, you don't want to think, oh, that fuzzy area might be a problem, Richard. No, you want to know, is that fuzzy area really smoothly transitioning between normal and diseased case or better or worse with treatment? Okay, so good tissue contrast and resolution uh, are, are important. Uh, for the animal studies, uh, you can image for hours, uh, for fixed tissues, uh, half a day even. Uh, and so you can make really nice pictures. But it turns out to, to get clinical data, you've got to do everything in about five or 10 minutes. And so uh, Tom Barrick and colleagues in the UK have developed some uh, schemes to acquire this data uh, quickly uh, from humans, and uh, they're, they're again fitting a Mittag Leffer function. Uh, again, the, the Q is the diffusion weighting term, that's a concatenation of the factors that go into B, and the delta is the basically the diffusion time. And, and these models are fit in this case for a, a, a normal, uh, healthy subject, uh, and it's uh, and, and the data is collected, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, three or four minutes. Uh, also, this model has been applied to uh, uh, a few patients. Uh, it's being examined now in clinical trials, but but initially it's been looked at uh, when you look at a brain tumor uh, with a relaxational agent, you can basically light the tumor up because of uh, permeability in the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and you see uh, differences in the pictures of the brain with uh, normal diffusion and with the fractional order models. Uh, and it gives you information of perhaps regions around the tumor where the, the tumor or the normal tissue may or may not have been compromised. Uh, other kinds of conditions uh, have different patterns. 
and, and the goal of this sort of work is to examine the pathology. Uh, you're not looking for a tumor. Uh, anyone who has a tumor like this has long uh, been, di or much earlier been diagnosed. The, the question is, can we detect these sorts of things very early? And can we detect changes in the tissue with successful radiation or drug therapy very early uh, so that we know it's working? Uh, so these models are all based upon uh, the continuous time random walk theory. Uh, there's a, a, another model of fractional calculus, as you know, that involves the uh, using uh, fractional motion. Uh, the CTRW model is nice because it can be sort of reorganized into something that looks like a, a modified metag leffler So instead of having an E sub alpha uh, X to the alpha, uh, we've got an alpha and a beta here. Uh, again, the data is collected as B, but we can make maps of different tissue structure. This is work that was done by Muge Carmen uh, uh, here in Chicago and with colleagues in China. Uh, the fractional motion model uh, has some statistical insight in terms of uh, it follows an exponential decay, but it assumes that the rate processes are time dependent. Uh, the statistics of this are reasonable, it goes all the way back to Mandelbrot, but the model starts getting squirrely in that you get terms involving the uh, the fractional parameters, uh, phi and psi here, uh, they become additive and multiplicative. And this is becomes degenerate in the sense that if you're trying to model a, a particular phenomena, uh, you can get the same exponent here because it always appears as a sum or a product. And this leads to uncertainty in uh, in diagnosis. And it, it uh, is, uh, but is a, a, a sensitive way of, distinguishing, in this case, low-grade and high-grade uh, tumors. So these are, these are uh, uh, human brain tumors, uh, gliomas in, in uh, young children, actually. The brains look small, as you can see. And uh, it's very important to classify the type and to be able to quickly assess the response or non-response of the tumor to treatment. So we started with this picture. How do we inform the images by using a model that employs fractional calculus? Uh, and I'll push this further. How do we choose the best model? If they're degenerate and if there's a whole Avogadro's number of models, then uh, it's not clear which one is going to be best or, be or better. Uh, and so what I've been doing recently, this is getting into the conjecture area, is trying to classify the models uh, typically in terms of, of where they lie in, in a uh, fractional cube or a space where you have an alpha and a beta here on the, on the, on the purple, uh, uh, or I guess the orange plane here. Here's the time derivative, here's the space derivative. And then the vertical axis here uh, is uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, another parameter that we can change. Here, the diffusion constant is assumed to not change in time. But in the fractional motion model, you can interpret it as having a time varying diffusion constant. Uh, for the case where uh, beta equals one, the, that is an exponential decay, or in the case where alpha is equal to two, uh, a, a, a Laplacian type motion here, then you get a, a, a similar face. So there are different faces of this cube that correspond to different slices of the set of models that you could build. Uh, one of your colleagues, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Rubens, uh, Irvin Lindsay and I wrote a paper on this recently, actually. Uh, just, to, just to show you a couple of tables here and then I'll quit talking and we'll do some questions and answering. Uh, if you look at the alpha and beta models here, for different parameters. Here's the Gaussian model down here in the corner. Beta is one, alpha is two. And, and the conventional Levy walk where you have a, a spatial derivative is here. The subordinated Brownian motion here where you have a fractional time derivative. And then you have the, the TTRW model that I've showed a couple of examples here where we have fractional time, fractional space models. And, and this all basically takes place within this plane, regions of sub super diffusion. The mean squared displacement of the water uh, goes as the diffusion coefficient uh, times the diffusion time raised to a power 
that looks like beta over alpha. The uh, fractional motion model, you have another set of the same kind of parameters. You get almost a degeneracy in terms of the uh, uh, the mean squared displacement, because down here in the corner, the mean squared displacement uh, goes as a 2 to the th, where the h now is a psi over phi parameter in the fractional motion model. And finally, uh, for the uh, the the uh, fractional power law model, you get a diffusion uh, mean squared displacement that, go that goes as a, as a nu plus beta term. So now we have these different models that that have different terms that vary either the order of the time or space derivative or the uh, space or, or, or the time dependence of the diffusion. Uh, Irving and some of his colleagues have done a lot of stuff with even space varying diffusion coefficients. Uh, the the, the take-home message here is that the, the process can become degenerate again. When you start seeing things like nu plus beta, you, if, if that's going to be, uh, <clears throat> you know, three, three fourths, you don't know whether that's one fourth plus a half or a half plus one fourth. And it makes a big difference. So these models then uh, uh, are, are just viewed here as a way of classifying the mean squared displacements corresponding to the different fractional forms. That, that the conventional fractional model uh, is powerful in that it generalizes ordinary diffusion. But it's just one of a set of time and space varying diffusion coefficients, which are linear differential equations or partial differential equations, but, but involve the actual integer order time. And here, fractional space, fractional time, integer order space. So it gets complicated. And you can choose whichever one you might use. Uh, the take home message, I think, is that we're going to have to choose something more than time. And if you noticed earlier, I pointed out that the uh, the diffusion sensitizing factor, the B, is a product of the diffusion pulses and the diffusion time. So instead of just collecting data as a function of time or direction, we're going to have to collect it as a function of diffusion weighting. And that probably means uh, a, a completely different type of data acquisition. OK, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I'll just try to point out that, that in general, in biological tissues, diffusion is anomalous. It is the, no, the new normal, as they keep saying nowadays. Uh, anomalous diffusion is everywhere. It's in viscoelasticity. It's in dielectrics. It's, it's, it's almost uh, any, anywhere you look, uh, you find uh, its fingerprint in the data. Uh, fractional calculus models, uh, we're biased. We're here at the conference. We like them, but they're versatile. That, that is, they're sort of like adjustable wrenches. You can you can adjust the order. And that's, that's very pleasing because the mathematics, uh, although challenging, the mathematics uh, follows a, uh, an, it, it, it interpolates between known values of order and known classes of models. Okay, I should acknowledge, uh, a lot of this data was collected by former students, uh, 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 Carson and uh, Guanyang and Muge, and others with colleagues uh, like Matt and Tom and Juan and uh, Joe Zhao. And uh, the ultimate utility of this is is being established, you know, in the clinic, in the uh, MRI community. But it's certainly a, 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 a useful and a, a, a powerful way to model the complexity of, of progressing progressive disease. Uh, also, I should mention there's a special issue of the journal Mathematics, and it's all open source. So if you just uh, click on this uh, URL down here, uh, you can get uh, sort of the latest papers that we've been working on on this topic. And so you'll be up to date. Uh, so I'll just close with two things. There is an anomalous relaxation and diffusion study group. It's uh, based in Brisbane. Uh, you're welcome to join that and uh, follow the lectures. Uh, in general, what we're talking about, I started with the Venn diagram, I'll end with a Venn diagram, is that we're using modeling and mathematics to inform and improve uh, the diagnosis and treatment in medicine.
So I think I will jump out of my talk here, if that's okay, Ruben. You there? Oops, I don't hear you. Just fine, Professor. Thank for your great presentation. Okay, am I doing okay on time? I figured I was. More than okay. Okay, I, I, for, for the questions. I'll okay, really good. I wanted to leave some time. And... Well, uh, I'll, I'll show some, some, some of the the, um, the comments people did. Okay. The first one here, Professor Megan. I could hear your talk every day. Very interesting. And the other one is from Edmundo, that was with me at Portugal last time we were together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do I know him? I may know him. Do I know him? Yes, he was with me at Portugal, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, in, when we go in, to the yeah. Fado show. Yeah, yeah, in in, uh, in Lisbon? No? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now, I miss uh, traveling. This this is just not good. I I, I want to go places. <laughs> <laughs> it would be oh, nice never to be here. Oh, Listen good. Listen to some sound, but show you our wonders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to meet your students and talk about fractional calculus. It would be nice. Carla? Okay, uh, let's start with the questions. Vinicius asked... Um, how the fractional calculus could be applied to phase encode MRI, particularly uh, phase contrast and Fourier velocity encoding? Yeah, good question. Uh, I have not done that. Uh, I, I think uh, that's a very good uh, idea, and I think you should go do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, the the, the Phase encoding, the only trouble with phase encoding is you only get two pi. You, once it goes around, it comes around. <laughs> when, you, when you sample your, 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 your uh, as a function of angle, you don't get uh, as many data points. But phase is, is the standard for elastography, for flow. Uh, the, the, uh, phase is used in, in many uh, phenomena. And uh, considering, uh, so, and I just go back to the MR equations, uh, just brute force substitute where there's a time derivative, a fractional time derivative, and, 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 you, and you know what you're going to get. And then, and then look at that model, as I was showing, and fit the model against the data. Yeah, uh, you know, flow, even turbulent flow, I don't know. Uh, flow through a, a complicated network or meshwork of a porous material. What we've seen with relaxation is that if you take and measure like the, uh, uh, the, the, dif the diffusion in uh, a, a fluid, you get reasonable numbers. If you then uh, a put a bunch of little beads, plastic beads, plastic beads, plastic beads in that in material, material. Yes, sir, we are yeah. having a problem with your microphone. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, maybe it's, I knocked it aside. So, so if if you're doing diffusion uh, in a porous material, the diffusion coefficient goes down. But as long as you have sort of a, uh, an aggregate of plastic spheres or glass spheres in your sample, uh, the diffusion coefficient still will be Gaussian. It, it it will just be reduced in magnitude. But if you put in small, medium, and large size plastic spheres so that the space of the diffusion is different for different parts of it, then you start seeing this anomalous kind of multi-exponential behavior. And that's, of course, what you see in most complicated tissues. So, uh, yeah, I have not done any work with uh, fractional phase encoding. Uh, be happy to talk to you about it sometime and, and be happy to see what you come up with. Very nice, Professor. Next one. Uh, next one was Felix, who said it. Uh, is it correct to associate anomalous diffusion uh, directly with Levy flights or Levy distribution? If you read my book, you'll hardly see the word Levy flight or Levy distribution because uh, it's only 694 pages long, and I admit 
as I wrote and thought about it, I did not understand enough about levy flights and levy distributions to even think about writing about it. It's only recently that I've become brave enough to even think about these things. Uh, the the uh, the mathematics becomes very challenging with the with the spatial derivatives, and uh, the the super diffusion that arises becomes problematical in a physical sense because uh, although mathematically you can talk about in a CTRW model the, the 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 particles being here and then all of a sudden they're being there well that involves they just moved at warp speed no pun intended <laughs> to get there instantaneously now you can go back and adjust the model to account for a, a mean uh, you know a finite velocity but the uh, the, the jumps that have to occur to get a levy process uh, typically are associated with, with a, a turbulence, a, a flow, or some kind of a, uh, a phenomena in addition to diffusion. It's, it's not a bulk flow, it's not laminar, uh, but there's something that, that causes the spins to leap. And it's very likely that this is what's going on. I mean, when you think about a, a tissue in the body, with the blood vessels going through it, each blood vessel uh, is uh, experiences a pulse and pressure with the contraction of the heart, and that pulse and pressure squirts a little blood. And if you look at the capillaries, the the, the actual blood red blood cell, it it's it's a little disc like this. It's too big to get through the capillary, so it folds over. And, and, and so and then it falls over and then it pops open and squirts on. And so there's certainly some kind of super diffusion going on in there at all levels. Uh, and so it's reasonable to think that these models could portray some of that. But you're going to have to find a way to average over the cubic millimeters, which involve millions to billions of cells or, or blood vessels, thousands of blood vessels to, you know, to try to characterize that. But I think uh, it's uh, it's still even in physical systems where you can control the onset of turbulence, the the models are much more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to 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 solve in in the mathematical sense, and they're also difficult to interpret. Very nice, professor. Very interesting, also. The next one is from uh, a very good student. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can do this one. Uh, no, I, I would like to know a little bit about um, about uh, how did the academic community in the area receive the, your results? They, did they know about the fractional <laughs> calculus earlier? I uh, know they they basically rejected. The, 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 yeah, I, I mean, what, 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 what do you do when you're confronted with something new and different? I mean, you attack it, right? I mean, wasn't it Gandhi that said, you know, first they ignore you, then they attack you, then you win, right? Well, yeah. No, but I, then, when then they saw the results, were they impressive? Uh, they are accepting of the results, but not of the interpretation. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, the, and the I problem, as I, point, as, I point, as I pointed out on those last slides, you have a degeneracy. You can envision a distribution of compartments, each of a different size, that could be characterized by a diffusion coefficient that varied in time and space as inverse power laws with integer space and time derivatives. The mean squared displacements, as, as Irvin and others have shown, come out exactly as t to the alphas, t to the betas. And those alphas and betas can be stuck on the fractional derivatives in space and time, or they can be stuck on the diffusion coefficient. And and uh, which one do you want to use? Uh, it, it's it's it's. I I think there's a lot to be said for interpreting uh, 
processes with memory and with non-locality. It just seems, I mean, I mean, look at Van der Waals equation. I mean, I mean, an ideal gases, you start off with a single gas where, where, the, where there's no interaction with the other molecules. And then you admit, okay, it's got some, it's got some physical size. So you, there, it has to have some repulsive and it's got some attractive force because we know that things, are, uh, you, you know, condense. So, so you start looking at that and there are, there, there are factors that you have to be able to interpret. And I, I think the fractional models uh, have the right statistical uh, uh, interpretation for modeling complex systems. And it works in dielectrics. It works in viscoelastic materials. It works in fluid mechanics. I mean, it, it works for almost everywhere we see it. Uh, but uh, th there's always a, a, a variety of ways of doing it. Uh, one can look at uh, pseudo differential operators. One can look uh, at uh, you know interpretations uh, with with nonlinear models. Uh, th th there are a lot of other ways you can you can you can add complexity to your system, and you you have to sort of pick which one you which one you want to use. Nice. But yeah, you can. We have published it. Uh, there are a lot of groups doing it. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's going to be increasingly useful. But the, I mean, my first paper was rejected unanimously. <laughs> I, that, the one I showed you that was published. I mean, I wrote probably the best letter I've ever written to the editor. I said, you know, dear professor, whoever, you know, you don't want to read this letter. I mean, you've already had my paper. You had three reviewers. They rejected it. It was clearly, you know, you know, I, I said, I've been an editor, I've written 100 papers, I agree with you 99 out of 100 times. But every once in a while, when something is summarily rejected, it's, it's, and it's not wrong, there's a possibility that it might be useful, or it might be different. And that, and, and so the, the editor liked my letter. And so he sent it to three more reviewers. And he said, now all you have to do is get all six to agree. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Very hard to work. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it, it's the way it works. But well, next one. Next one from Professor Carla. Uh, do you have a parameter space alpha or beta, uh, which may ca uh, characterize a specific brain disease biologically? What is the meaning of alpha or beta, if any? Thank you. Always a pleasure to listen to you. Yeah, uh, that's what we're looking for. And, and we've been looking at well-established animal models of degenerative brain disease. And so you, 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 these are animals that have a, a, a degenerative brain condition that you can program in genetically and then you can see it progress from week to week. And then you can look to see how the alphas and betas change. Uh, and and what we're seeing is that uh, in general the alphas seem to be the most sensitive. Th that is this time dependent factor, uh, and that in many cases we can set the beta equal to two and just leave it alone. Uh, and and but you know where I could be wrong is the question earlier about flow. It might just flip if you start applying fractional models to flow. It might very well work out that the betas become very important. But when you think about uh, the, I worked for postdoc at the National Cancer Institute. I looked at a lot of mouse tumors. I looked at a lot of pathology. I talked to a lot of doctors. And, and, and the process by which a group of cells uh, decide that they can no longer exist as a normal part of your body and they start to uh, mutate and then metastasize and develop their own little independent scheme uh, has different events occurring at different scales and different times. And if we can get a handle on those time scales and events and fit the alphas and betas to it, being that it's a complex structure, we might be able to, to establish early fingerprints for mm -hmm the likelihood of the disease progressing or not progressing. So I think it, it goes back to the physical interpretation, which is what do you mean by the alpha? What do you mean by the beta? And I think in the fractional community, I use the CTRW model. Uh, the the uh, fractional motion model just says that there's some correlation in uh, 
you know, that if you jump to the right the next time, you're more likely to jump to the right. I mean, that, that's a reasonable thing to do. In kinetic theory, when you talk about collisions of gas molecules, I've been reading PCHEM textbooks, uh, that there's something called persistence of velocities. That, that is, if you have some velocities in a collision, uh, they aren't completely randomized. That, that, uh, that a, a high velocity is more likely to continue in the direction that it's coming from. It's not the, the billiard ball collection. There's a persistent uh, sub-velocity, and that, that would show up in this fractional motion model. And that, that might be a way to connect a physical event with a mathematical term. But that's that, that's very important to establish. Uh, on one hand, the, the clinicians want, uh, as I showed with the entropy, they want a clear-cut, pretty picture that's sensitive and specific. I mean, that's what I want. I mean, my brain's going to stop functioning someday. But it, but but if it starts, uh, I, I want to know early, and I want to know exactly, you know, what the problem is. Uh, with many conditions, you don't know till it's too late. Very yeah. nice, Professor. That especially from a mother, Alzheimer's disease, it would be uh, a, a great step. Yes, yes. That, well, that, there's a, there is a lot of work being done on that. Next one. Next one is from Roberto. Uh, it's idea for his PID thesis, he's saying. Uh, the question is, do you know something about fractional calculus applied to EEG forward problem? That was easy. No. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the trouble with fractional calculus, it's like the hammer theory. You know, if you have a big enough hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, you know, fractional calculus is not the answer to every problem in the world. We can't have fractional calculus models of the universe, fractional quantum mechanics, fractional Schrodinger equations, fractional relativity. I mean, just because it's math doesn't mean that it's that it's uh, that it's uh, uh, useful and needed. Uh, I come at it from the perspective that when there's a complexity in in the interaction or in the associations of the conglomerate particles, then you're going to need fractional calculus. So I'll turn the question around in terms of the EEG. Uh, uh, what aspects of, I mean, already that, that, that's a coordinated motion. It isn't just 10,000 axons firing at random. That's noise, right? 10,000 axons firing randomly, it's just going to be white noise. You're not going to get 8 hertz, 12 hertz. You're not going to get the, the, the you, you're not going to get evoked potentials. You're not going to get the the periodic brain uh, signals that are recorded. So there's already some coherence going on there, and the, and and I I don't know of anybody who has looked into that aspect uh, using fractional calculus. But uh, if 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 the data are not effectively modeled by what you're doing. Uh, it might be an opportunity to use fractional calculus. But then, as I said earlier, just because you can do it doesn't mean everyone is going to say it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Professor, we are running out of time, but okay. we have time for uh, just to show that Manuel Ortigueira was here earlier, and he said it's always a pleasure to, <laughs> to, to see you talking about oh. the application of fractional calculus. Yeah. I spent, uh, I spent, uh, I guess a couple a month, a couple of times uh, visiting in uh, in Lisbon with with uh, uh, Manuel Ortegara, and uh, he's a very, very, very valued and interesting colleague. And I, I just the thing I hate about COVID now is I, I just can't up and plan. I'm I'm supposed to be at at Cambridge this month. Uh, there's supposed <laughs> there's a big fractional calculus meeting going on at Cambridge, and I I saw Igor Podlubny. He's there right now. And Blasphenagra is going next month, and but I'm not going. I mean, I don't want to die. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. No, Professor. Again, thank you very thank much you. for your My pleasure. great presentation. Hope to have you here in Brazil in the third edition. Oh, great, great! I look forward to meeting you again and visiting. Take care. Nice to meet you, Carla. Nice to meet you too. Bye, bye. Okay. Pessoal, então, encerramos aqui o, o dia de hoje. Encontro vocês amanhã. See you all tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.